Uh, I'd like to thank Joel Obermeyer and Widen the Circle for the honor of introducing Annika de Ruder, a 2024 awardee of the Obermeyer Award. The program was established a quarter century ago and has honored over 100 individuals and organizations, many of whom are whose faces I recognize here today, that raise awareness of Jewish history and culture in their communities and fight the rise of hate, prejudice, and antisemitism. I'm Karen Franklin. I'm a co-founder of the award. And in case you're counting back from those 25 years, I just want to establish the fact that I was 10 years old when I founded the award. Okay, don't don't laugh too hard. I'm also a, a former jury chair and director of family research at the Leo Beck Institute. Most of you know the Institute. It's a library and archive of German Jewish culture and history about to celebrate our 70th anniversary year and also a thriving organization that keeps the memory of this history alive through programs, exhibits, and cooperation in activities such as those of Widen the Circle. In my uh, work as Director of Family Research, I'm aware of the magnitude of the work of local historians in Germany and also educators whose passion makes a difference in the lives of so many people. It's very often that I and my work connect individuals interested in their Jewish history in Germany with the awardees and their work. Annika's work in the town of Lüneburg to find the descendants of former Jewish residents, connecting them to each other after decades of dispersal throughout the planet and to restitute their cultural patrimony, uh, as well as work with the current residents of Lüneburg to educate them about former residents and Jewish community and the lives of the descendants is extraordinary and inspiring. And it is important and personally it is most meaningful to me because as some of you know i'm also quite involved in the uh, world of restitution recognizing the power of reconciliation that it brings a small amount of justice to those from whom the objects were taken then also allowing for um, the reconciliation in so many different ways to end reconnections. And throughout the decades, the jury has reviewed countless nominations that describe a broad swath of activities. But I believe this is the first one that recognizes uh, a dedicated worker in the area of returning looted art and possessions. And Annika's nomination was dis uh, succinctly acknowledges this contribution. The nomination reads, her legacy can be summed up in four words, restitution, reunion, relationships, and reconciliation. Joel, I turn the program back over to you. Thank you, Karen. Uh, I'll just, I just wanted to say thank you to Karen and thank you for the Leo Beck Institute for co-sponsoring this event. Uh, Karen, it is a pleasure to be back speaking someplace with you, uh, given that we've had such a long history of working together on the awards. So thank you. Um, my name is Joel Obermeyer. I'm the executive director of Widen the Circle, for those of you who don't know us. Um, thank you for joining our series, Conversations with 2024 Obermeyer Award winners. Uh, we're excited to continue this series by speaking with Annika de Ruder. Uh, before I turn to her, uh, first let me mention a couple things. One is about an upcoming conversation that's going to be next in our series. On April 18th, we'll have an event with Christoph Mani, an award winner who works in an area of Germany, in Thuringia actually where the power of the far right and neo-Nazis is growing, um, and his modern creative approach to remembrance, sometimes using virtual reality techniques. Um, his approach to German Jewish history has energized young people and adults alike. Um, at the same time, he's come against some serious resistance to the idea of remembering it all. So links to register for that event will be in chat. Um, and now let's move on. Um, I'm gonna, before I get to Annika, I also wanna do a quick introduction to Ride and Widen the Circle for anybody who doesn't know us. Uh, why in the Circle uses history and remembrance to heal from historic injustice and combat modern prejudice. We empower people working on the local level, uh, primarily in Germany and now also in the United States, to make a more just world um, as we focus on two specific histories, German Jewish history and the Holocaust, which is where we started, and um, increasingly now leg uh, its legacies and also the legacy of his and the history of racism in the United States. Uh, why in the Circle has offices in the United States and Germany, and we work in three program areas. The first is the Obermeyer Awards, which Karen just mentioned, and they've been going on for the last 25 years and that were founded by my father and Karen. Uh, second, and I should say also Sarah Nahama, who's on this call, 
I definitely need to give you a nod, Sarah. Uh, second, Why in the Circle has also developed and nurtured a network of German activists who do remembrance projects and use remembrance to fight modern prejudice in Germany. And our third area, uh, Why in the Circle builds bridges among educators, activists, and thought leaders in the United States and Germany who are dealing with historic legacies of injustice. Uh, we run a fellowship program that brings a cohort of these amazing people together in Berlin so they can learn, share knowledge, collaborate, and do all these things to amplify their further work. Okay, that's enough on why in the circle. Let's get to Annika, please. Uh, I want to just uh, say a couple quick things about Annika. As a Providence researcher, Annika has uh, Annika de Ruder has been helping to restore items obtained unlawfully during the Nazi period to their rightful owners. A decade ago, she began doing this work for a museum in the town of Lüneburg near Hamburg, Hamburg, excuse me, uh, the same town where she grew up. More recently, she has been working for this Hamburg State and University Library. Uh, she also trains other library and archive professionals in how to do provenance research. And meanwhile, largely on her own time, she has delved into the history of Jews in her region. Her latest project is a website and database about the history of Jewish life in Lüneburg, uh, which went online last year. As we'll see, Annika believes that each object, no matter how small, can tell an amazing story. Humble objects, really humble objects, can bring together families who are scattered across the globe and can lead to real acts of restitution and healing. For her work, Annika received a 2024 Obermeyer Award. And because of that, we have a short film about her. And I would love for us to watch it now. Ich heiße Annike de Rudda und ich bin Historikerin und Provenienzforscherin. Ich beschäftige mich hauptsächlich eben mit der Suche nach Nazi-Raubgut in den Beständen von Museen oder Bibliotheken. Was ist Provenienzforschung? Also Provenienz ist ein komplizierter Begriff für eine ganz einfache Sache. Das ist das, was ich immer sage. Provenienz heißt einfach nur Herkunft. Wo kommen die Dinge her? Und bei mir speziell geht es um Nazi-Raubgut, um Sachen, die in der Zeit des Nationalsozialismus entweder direkt beschlagnahmt worden sind oder wo Menschen gezwungen worden sind, etwas zu verkaufen, etwas wegzugeben, sich von Dingen zu trennen. Also wenn Menschen das schon mal gehört haben, diesen Begriff und die Sache, dann denken sie meistens an die großen Museen, an die großen Bilder, Arnolde, Liebermann, was weiß ich, Van Gogh, ja, Sachen, die Millionen wert sind. Und was ich aber mache, ich mache das eben auf einer anderen Ebene, also in kleineren Museen oder in Bibliotheken, wo es um Dinge geht, die nicht so wahnsinnig viel wert sind. Im ersten Moment denkt man auch, oh Gott, ich meine, sich mit diesem Kleinkram zu beschäftigen, irgendwelche Bücher oder äh, Möbel oder Silber oder was auch immer, wo man auch im ersten Moment denkt, ist es das überhaupt wert, sich damit zu beschäftigen? Aber ja, das ist es. Und das sind sozusagen die kleinen Dinge. Das Museum, wie es bis 2009 stand, vertrat so ein bisschen die Auffassung Lüneburg in der NS-Zeit. Da gibt es eigentlich gar nicht so viel drüber zu erzählen. Und das ist eine Auffassung, die wir natürlich nicht äh, teilen. Also ich finde, dass das eine Selbstverständlichkeit war, sich dieses äh, Themas intensiver anzunehmen. Und das lag sozusagen auf der Hand und ist eher sozusagen ein Ausgleich langjähriger Versäumnisse. Das Museum in Lüneburg hat eben Dinge in seinem Bestand, die aus dieser jüdischen Familie Heinemann kommen. Das ist auch immer schon klar gewesen, denn Markus Heinemann, der ein bedeutender Bankier und Mäzen war und ein großer Freund des Museums im 19. Jahrhundert, hat dem Museum ganz viele Dinge geschenkt. Und dann ist das, ist das Museum mal von außen darauf hingewiesen worden, dass da doch ein paar Sachen etwas problematisch sind und dass sie sich das mal genauer angucken sollen. Im Vorfeld äh, nach diesem Hinweis von außen natürlich geschaut, was haben wir an Unterlagen, was finde ich an Unterlagen, zu dieser Provenienzgeschichte Heinemann. Das heißt, man guckt die Katalogbücher, die Zugangsbücher des Museums durch, auch äh, sozusagen jeden Eintrag zu prüfen. Also da setzte dann deine Tätigkeit ein. Das wichtigste und bedeutendste Stück, was damals 1940 eben angekauft worden ist, unrechtmäßig, ist dieses, äh, diese äh, Schauseite einer gotischen Truhe. Und Markus Heinemann war eben ein muss man sagen, Lüneburger Lokalpatriot, der halt zur Lüneburger Geschichte selber auch gesammelt hat und der eben diese äh, Truhe auch bei sich zu Hause im Haus hängen hat. Ist. Und dieses Ding hat seit 1940 ununterbrochen im Museum gestanden. Aber eben bis vor ein paar Jahren hat man die Geschichte nicht erzählt, die dahinter steckt. Als dann klar war, dass das NS-Raubgut war, musste man die Erben suchen. I received 
uh, an email in 2014 from Anaki de Ruder out of the blues asking if I was a descendant of Marcus Heinemann because she'd found my name in an obituary for my mother. And I was very surprised because I had no contact with all the descendants. So it was a big surprise to get this. And, und das war eine unglaubliche Sache. Und dann haben wir eben nach und nach, weiß ich nicht, über 40 Leute gefunden, überall auf der Welt. And, and Annika opened this window into the family history, the family legacy in Lüneburg, the details that Annika has been able to fill in for us and her patience and, and translating and speaking to us in English. And that's where Annika was a treasure. She found the history of our family. Ja, und dann ging es natürlich auch um die Sache selber. Also ich habe eben gesagt, so, wir haben was gefunden. Das gehört euch. Das ist unrechtmäßig erworben worden von uns. Und das Museum möchte das gerne an euch zurückgeben. Dann haben die schließlich gesagt, okay, wir haben uns jetzt geeinigt. Ähm, wir nehmen die Dinge zurück und dann äh, machen wir eine Leihgabe ans Museum für zehn Jahre. Und das war natürlich eine wunderbare Lösung. Und vor allem, weil dann in diesem Zusammenhang eben eine zweite Idee aufkam. Und das war äh, die Idee, wir machen daraus ein Familientreffen der Heinemanns in Lüneburg. That was a life-changing experience when we got together in Lüneburg in 2015. And Anaki was the one that made it all possible. She organized it so that we would learn about Lüneburg, we would visit the homes of our family members, and we would get to know each other. And there were people from all generations. It was a wonderful reunion, and I got very close to people that I had never met. We discovered that even though Anaki had done so much to help our extended family, she also had helped many others along the way. Also was ich immer wieder erstaunlich finde, ist, dass diese kleinen Dinge eine so große Bedeutung bekommen können. Ohne diese Dinge wären, wären alle diese alle diese Geschichten nicht passiert, wäre dieser Kontakt nie zustande gekommen, wären diese Menschen nie hierher gekommen, hätte ich, hätte ich das nie, hätten die Lüneburger das auch nie gesehen. Wir müssen ganz transparent machen, was hier bei uns passiert ist, was unsere Institutionen gemacht haben, wer beteiligt war, Namen nennen, Orte nennen und so weiter. Also das ist auch für mich so ein großes Thema. Das war auch schon immer, fand ich immer total gut, konkrete Erinnerung zu sagen, da ist es passiert, das sind die Leute, so haben, das sind die Namen, hier haben sie gewohnt, das hat ihnen gehört. So hat ihr Auto ausgesehen, ja. Das war ihr Buch. Hier steht ihr Name drin. Wonderful. Uh, uh, I'm happy everyone here had a chance to study that film and uh, learn a little bit more about Annika's work. Um, I'm uh, now let's meet Annika. And Annika, while you're coming on, I'm just going to mention two people who are in the film who are in our audience right now. I want to say hi to Becky Cohn Vargas and also to Christina Heinemann, uh, both of whom I saw enter earlier. So you guys, you're part of the story and thank you for joining us. Okay, Annika, um, maybe we should uh, talk a little bit. It seems like a good idea at these events. Mm -hmm. uh, so here's what I was wondering we could start with, something pretty basic, which is um, it's clear you have a deep enthusiasm, maybe gusto for this work. Uh, I'm just wondering what makes it so exciting for you? Well, um, first of all, <laughs> always bad to start with first of all, but I just want to say hello to everybody. I just scrolled through the ah, yeah, let's pause for that participants for a and I saw that there are so many people who I haven't seen in a long time. The Stern mm -hmm. family from Israel, wonderful. Also some of the descendants of the Valentin families and some others, maybe I didn't see you all, but hey, wow, I'm, I'm very glad you're all there. And I wish we could be together, uh, really together. <laughs> But, you know, we have to deal with it. So thank you. Thanks, Joel, for inviting me. Thanks to the Leo Beck okay. Institute, Karen, for all this. Wonderful. So what makes this so, what did you say, exciting? Yeah, so, yeah, so, so look, yeah let's start with a, a first quick question, which is basically, yeah. what makes this yeah. so exciting for you? Yeah. Um, well, the, there's, I don't know, there's a couple of things. The first probably is, um, I just love to find out things. You know, I'm, I'm always, I always want to know more about, different kinds of things that mm -hmm. uh, I see, that I hear. Uh, I'm always asking questions. Uh, people are constantly making fun of me that I always say, hmm, not sure if this is really true. You know, maybe I should check. Uh, Katharina uh, 
this goes all to you. It's a historian's thing, maybe, you know, we're just always being very skeptical and always asking questions. And and also always, I always like to find out where things come from, mm -hmm. why, how did things become what they are today? You know, what's the history? And so that's one of the things. And then, which goes along with that, I just, I, I'm, I like to do this kind of detective work. So like mm -hmm. always looking at pieces of a puzzle. And then I like these moments where you think, hmm, you know, I have this and this and this, and but how does it all fit together? So that's this kind of research is sort of like really good for me because <laughs> that's really what I like to do. And it's also like a true detective, very often you have the feeling that it doesn't get anywhere and you're not you're not finding the answers and so on. And you just have to look at it again from yeah. a different angle. And sometimes you you know, listen to something else or you hear or you read something and suddenly you see, ah, I haven't, you know, I haven't tried this angle yet or I haven't tried this step. So that's something I really like. And then as everybody who is, who knows me uh, <laughs> can probably tell, I just really love to be uh, with all of you and uh, just to relate to people from all over the world. I always, I'm always happy when I can speak English and if, you know, if that gets me anywhere and, and, um, if it helps. Uh, Anna, could you mean kind of connecting to descendants through this work? Is that? Yes. Yes. Right. To connecting to descendants, um, and having this special kind of thing that comes with, you know, you don't know each other at all. You've never met, you don't know anything about each other. And then there you have, as you mentioned before, these tiny objects or something, bigger objects, all kinds of things, uh, that make a connection and that that start a connection that wouldn't have been there before if, if if it hadn't been for these things so so that's kind of yeah it's it's an amazing thing to happen that that uh, these things can start so many um new perspectives new tracks into history new new and ways new relationships of, also relationships you know meeting each other and yeah. meet, meeting each other getting to know each other not just me and the descendants but also the descendants among themselves and also uh as soon as descendants come over um to the and, and and sort of get to know the institutions they get to know the, my colleagues and people working with me volunteers at the museum we had a lot of volunteers sure without sure. whom i couldn't have done it yeah so that's that's um this whole thing of reconnecting or connecting in general yeah, that makes sense um uh one quick thing before we keep going for those of you who are joining us, if you have a question, please go ahead and put it in chat. Um, we're probably going to get them toward the end, but we're going to we'll collect them all and we'll uh, go through them uh, later. So if a question occurs to you, feel free to ask. So Annika, detective work, connecting with people in different ways. Um, I'm wondering. We saw. We certainly got a sense of that from the film. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that we didn't you didn't see quite as much. What I think I would love to hear from your perspective is when you're re, you know, giving back these objects and creating these relationships and giving people their history back, essentially, uh, what does it feel like to the Germans? Um, what, what I know is when you return something, you often invite descendants to yeah. Germany, let's say to Lüneburg, like you saw. Mm -hmm. uh, as I understand it, you also invite lots of Germans, museum people or local residents to kind of take part in that moment. Mm -hmm. uh, can you talk a little bit about the feeling and meaning for the Germans who were there? Mm -hmm. It's, of course, always you know hard to tell what it means to other people but from what i can tell by their mm -hmm. reactions it's it has to do a lot lot with how much they knew before you know like if it's people who who've been active in this field as well or if it's people who've like you know, come there for the first time and one of the things which is you know very sad but it's just a fact in germany is that many people in germany have no way no no idea how they you know they don't know any jewish they don't know any jewish people they just uh you know they've never met anybody maybe they have but they don't know so lots of germans are like oh you know how, I, I hope i don't say the wrong thing and uh, mm -hmm. i mean you know that it's probably part of your work always like this thing of uh, somehow thinking uh you know they're different and then realizing no <laughs> it's just you mm. know sure. uh, that's one of the that's one a very small first step and then very often uh, it's also people who maybe don't know too much about you mm -hmm. know like the workings of na national socialist uh, history and so on right. and, and and um persecution of jews so for them it's a way of of realizing what happened in their own institution in their own town uh through a person and through also again an object so it makes it much more relatable if you if you have something that you can actually look at and you have people you can talk to and if you know 
you realize, especially in this, like in Lüneburg, it's a pretty small town, and and just realizing that these were people who, if they hadn't their, their ancestors hadn't been driven out, maybe some of them would actually still be living there, and and you know would be like. Um, a so so it's, it's sort of a, a moment of realization for the Germans who were there. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, and and also it's uh, it's of course especially if it's like uh, at the library we mainly have um, colleagues because it's a huge library we have you know a couple of hundred people working there and then there's I don't know maybe 40 50 60 who come to these restitutions and for them it's of course also realizing something about their institution and the history um, of of the of the library or if, also in, in larger museums um, mm -hmm. and uh, maybe also you know they realize what i'm doing <laughs> because very often they go like there's this weird colleague and she's doing what is she something. doing over in that corner all the time yeah, i Got cannot it. even announce what she's doing and i wonder what it is and suddenly they they it's very easy to understand you know once sure. you sure. witness the restitution or, or everybody who's ever been there will be can grasp what this is about it's about yeah. um as karen said uh, what did you say it's about restoring a small amount of justice that's yeah. I think that's a very good way of saying it, and it's about reconnecting and you know, yeah, just making sure people are being seen and being heard, and their names are being called out and sure. what they do. Sure. Yeah. So um, I would love to jump into an example of this, um, and I would say both an example of about objects and an example of your detective work, and so I'm wondering if you could briefly talk through an example. An mm. example I'm thinking of is a, uh, what you called a cold case when you told me about it. Yes, uh, you've been working on. I believe it's a set of books. I'm going to call them the Kamnitzer books because I don't know what else yes. to call them. Yes. Uh, but can you tell me how this particular case developed and what you found out? Uh, sorry, it's just raining really hard here right now, so I'm I'm going to put it a little louder. Um, sure. Do you need do you need me to repeat the question? No, no, it's, it's fine. No, no, it's just uh, it's one of these weird days. Today so there's sunshine and then rain and hail. Sure. Storm. Sure. Um, yeah, so the the Chemnitzer case, that's nice, that sounds good. Um, these are a couple of books that uh, that were already found by colleagues of mine probably 10, 15 years ago because we knew that they had come from the Gestapo, so they were looted books. Um, our library has uh, received in the 1940s, it received uh, probably tens of thousands of books which were looted books and which uh, the Gestapo had confiscated from people who were either deported or who had emigrated and, and had to leave other things behind. Mm -hmm. um, so it's it's a very clear, uh, all these books are, are clearly uh, looted, uh, looted assets, looted objects. Um, sure. And, and we, uh, we always look in, 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 so every book that's still there, um, my colleagues a long time ago uh, looked into it and saw, looked if there were any, any kinds of um, provenance markers, you know, like stamps or book plates or autographs. And one of the many, many books they found which had a marker was, uh, were a couple of books who had the name of Kamnitz uh, um, written inside in, in uh, different kinds of handwriting, but always the same name and sometimes also Leo Kamnitzer. And I just stumbled upon it and I thought, I, I saw that they, they weren't even sure if it's Ramnitzer with an R or Kamnitzer with a K. And so first thing I did is um, I looked it up and I thought, okay, is what's like more of a Jewish name? What what do you happen to find when you just Google Google the names? And I saw, I thought, of course, yeah, it's Kamnitzer, obviously, because there were many people of that name. So now we, and then I, I found uh, two or three Leo Kamnitzers. So the question okay. was, which one is it? Um, uh, and uh, it's a little difficult because there were many, you know, like two or three different kinds of signatures. One was a dedication. And so I started with that because the dedication had, had uh, it says uh, uh, to Leo uh, with best wishes from, you know, uncle so-and-so and it had a date. Um, and also it had his little, his name and his handwriting and I, I looked at one Leo Kamnitzer who I thought might be, you know, most likely the one I'm looking for. And I saw when he was born and then looked at the date and it was not his birthday. But then I realized, ah, because the book looked very much like a present you would give to somebody who is like uh, starting uh, his adult life more or less. So I thought, you know, in a, in a Christian kind of setting would have been the confirmation 
present, maybe. So I thought maybe it's a bar mitzvah, my bar mitzvah present. Ah, and sure. I wasn't, I, I knew the like bar mitzvah is like about 13, you have to be 13 years old. And I checked and I saw, which all you of course knew, uh, know, but I, did, I wasn't, I didn't know exactly before. That's always like the Shabbat after the 13th um, birthday, right? Sure. So, and then I checked the dates and I, I saw that this day was actually the Shabbat after his 13th mm. birthday. So, he, so had a, I, he had an it, uncle who it, gave him a book of poetry for his bar mitzvah. Yes, it was a book of, uh, yeah, it was like a typical, you know, <laughs> something that if you're 13, you don't really read it. It's a, a typical sort of thing a, an uncle or, you know, some kind sure. of relative would give you to say, this is very good for you. And it, it teaches you something about sure. life and so on. Um, I, yeah. I think I got a few gifts like that when I was bar mitzvah, so I totally <laughs> get it. <laughs> Yeah. And so that was, I was, of course, very uh, happy when I uh, realized that uh, this was the right uh, kind of uh, idea that I had. And it, it really worked out and uh, that, that this was it. And so I knew this was him. And then I realized, OK, because the first his first signature was written when he was 13 years old, you know, and the others were written much, much later when he was a grown up and he had uh, changed his handwriting uh, to look completely different. Uh, OK, and, so you uh, understood why they were different. That's it. That's why they were really, I mean, really widely different. But I still knew he was the right guy because of the books. Also, there were books about anti-Semitism. And then I found out when I when I knew I had the right guy, I found out that he, when he was an adult, he joined different kinds of um, organizations that fought anti-Semitism in Germany in the 1920s. Um, and that, you know, so everything fell into place. And I realized that the, the I had put together um, many parts of the puzzle, not uh, not all of them, but uh, yeah. And so. and are you convinced? Uh, I mean, it sounds like you don't yet know whether he sur survived or whether he has. De do you know if he has descendants that might have survived? If you kind of yeah. what the rest of the story is, or are you still looking? I'm still looking, uh, but I'm pretty sure there are descendants, and uh, we will find them and then reach out to them. Yeah. Okay. So so this is our message to the people with us now. If any of you know uh, you are related to or know somebody who's related to Leo Kamnitzer. <laughs> definitely get in touch with us yes yes yeah. <laughs> very good very good um what what i love about that love about that explanation is you can sort of see how the objects tell stories right i would not have known to think of that as a bar mitzvah gift without your explanation of how you got there um so mm -hmm. that was pretty great um i want to turn to something else that we talked about a little bit which was um that the work that's being done now around um, who owns objects, particularly objects that aren't that valuable. Mm. So, right, a piece of woodwork, a piece of furniture, um, a set of dishes, a book. Um, what I understand is that in the late 90s, uh, and Karen Franklin knows this better than I, there's an effort to deal with Nazi looted art that led to the Washington principles, right, guidelines that are about how art should be dealt with and other things that museums might have. Uh, my understanding is those were voluntary. Uh, and you told me that many German institutions like museums still didn't consistently look for these small things that had been taken even after the Washington principles were in, in effect. And I was just wondering if you could give me just kind of like a brief explanation of why you think it took a while even after that for mm. people to start doing the kind of work that you do. Yeah, it has to do with a... Um... A certain continuity in, in the personnel of German institutions. I think that's one of the explanations. Really? Are, of course. Um, but, uh, um, you know, there are many, especially museums, but also libraries, you sometimes had directors who would be there for 20, 30 years. Um, mm -hmm. So you would have maybe one who was still there even during the Nazi time and then just stayed on because, mm -hmm. you know, he could prove that he was like no bad sure. Nazi. So. <laughs> and yeah. uh, he could just stay. Maybe he was, but maybe he pretended he wasn't. Whatever. So they stayed on, and then they they picked their successor. Maybe maybe in the fifties, mm. you know. And the successor came, and he stayed on maybe for another 20, 30 years, and then he picked his successor. These were men mainly, so I'm talking about he and his, you know. Yeah, okay. Okay. Um, and you're and, and you're so, saying they have a sort of response felt uh, uh, responsibility one another not to delve into all these things. That's so. it. And so they said, well, yeah, maybe there's something, but, you know, uh, uh, let's just not not look into it. And then also, especially um, for uh, smaller museums like in Lüneburg, many uh, places um, had the feeling that this is not something that we have to be dealing with. It's maybe something for the larger museums, which have the really value, valuable art and uh, and you know where where people who who um, 
who lost this or who, when they, it was taken away from them, they still have pictures, you know, they have like a photograph of their sitting room, which which has the Van Gogh or the Lieberman uh, sure. uh, on, on, on the wall. And so so many, uh, especially uh, smaller museums and also libraries, um, when this all started, they couldn't, I mean, it's not just, I wouldn't put this too negatively, they just couldn't imagine how they would be able to find um, Nazi looted art in their collections, because especially if you're a museum that has lots of like furniture and, you know, as you said, um, silverware or glass or whatever, um, they're not always um, discernible. It's not not easy to to say if this is really the 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 one that we're looking for. And so it there's a lot of research uh, in the in the context. You you can't you know it's with books. It's sometimes easier if there's something in the book. Then you have a clue, but especially with objects that have been produ mass produced or or at least manufactured, you know that there are many objects who look more or less the same, and it's it's very difficult to find out what how these objects got to to a certain uh, place and how and and so it needs a lot of um, research, not too much into the objects, but into the way they got into the play in, in into the collection. So you look at. Where did we get them from? You know, who did we buy them from? Who was this person we bought it from? Was it a, a collector or was it a, you know, maybe it's, was it even a Jewish person? Or in Lunebook, sometimes I looked at people who uh, took things to the museum as a present who used to live in a place that used to be owned by Jewish people. Mm -hmm. before. So, you know, maybe when they moved in, when they Aryanized the place or just, they just moved in, there was still something in, in the house, which used to belong to the people who had lived there before, the, to the Jewish families. So that's one of the things, you know, so, so you have to um, do a, a far more research all around the objects and not so much uh, about the objects themselves because they don't, they don't give, you know, they don't uh, carry so much history obviously in them. So you have to, to look around and then you realize that there is some history, but it's, uh, it's not uh, very obvious, yeah. That makes sense. That makes sense. I mean, uh, uh, that something that's considered less valuable would take longer for people to get to it. Can I ask ask you, um, as I understand from you, in the early 2000s, this became, things began to change, as you sort of said, um, mm -hmm. more, more work began to be done in this area. And uh, my understanding is part of this is a, a little bit related about the difference between compensation and restitution. Mm -hmm. um, my understanding is that mostly you're focused on restitution in a way. Can you just talk, just give us a brief explanation about what that's about? Yeah, we're not we're not working on the basis of any hard law. We call it soft law. So the Washington principles are not part of the German judicial judicial system in any way. So uh, um, it's and, you know nobody can make claims uh, um, on on the basis of some some kind of given law. But um, but of course people can make claims and just say you know I'm morally entitled to this because I can prove that you stole it. And what the museums and the libraries do is um, they try to find out before ancestor uh, before descendants come come up to them and that's so much better and that you know it's it's um it's so important that we do it that we don't wait for people to come up and say uh hey i think you've got something there that doesn't belong to you but we have to look for it we have to you know make this active um effort to to find the things and not just wait for other people to make claims um and and so we're it, it's all in this realm of um moral obligation which is very strong and and, and it's it's hard for an institution in germany uh to completely neglect this to you know to not not take this into consideration because you know there's the press and there's descendants and there's just people maybe also historians provenance researchers who you know, if a, if an institution doesn't do anything, they will make sure that you know this institution is is sort of <laughs> um, well that that it, it gets known that they should do something. So um, I think there are many. Sadly, there are still many institutions who are, um, you know, not not doing enough, or maybe mm -hmm. not doing anything. Or if if they um, if they find out, then they they don't put enough time and so in it but there are many 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 places where like my colleagues um mm -hmm. are doing just the same work as i do so really trying to to find out and really trying to reach out to the descendants and so on makes sense. It, it, it sounds like to me like it depends on how much resources are put into the effort yes and that's i mean that's what we haven't been talking about this but this is of course always follow the money so that's always the the big thing that it took some time before there was a 
a way of financing this research. So like the, the first people who started to do it in Germany uh, were already working at, at an, in a, a library or a, a museum and just started to do it as, you know, they, they had some kind of job and they they started to, to do the research, but it wasn't part of their job description uh, originally. And then it took some time before we had a, an institution uh, to finance uh, this kind of research. And now we're very, very lucky to have the uh, German looted art, uh, um, what's it called? The uh, uh, looted art center. German Lost Art Foundation. <laughs> sorry, uh, Herr Hartmann. I'm sorry. I didn't know the <laughs> at the end of the show. So this meet meet Uwe Hartmann, who is uh, uh, the main person for all of us, who's like the the one we're all talking to all the time, all the provenance researchers, and who helps us along and who makes sure or tries to make sure that there's uh, still funding, although the research has been going on uh, for some time. So ever since this has started i mean and he can tell you more about it but it, it took some time before it really um um you know but we, before there was uh, enough money to to finance all kinds of projects and that is so important because hardly any institution in germany has the means to finance this uh, on their own you know like uh, even if you're a really large museum and you don't necessarily have a full-time provenance researcher yeah i mean um, it, it, i mean it sounds like just because the objects are smaller, it doesn't mean the amount of work to figure out about them, what they are, who they came from, what their story is, is any less. Right, right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's it's just as important, yes. Of course, if you're, you know, if if you're a museum and you have lots and lots of things, you will usually start with the most valuable ones. Of That's course. I mean, of course. you always have to make some kind of um you set have to set your priorities, but uh, but more and more places are, are really doing this research um, in, in, into into objects that are not too valuable. And um, uh, one of the things I really like about it is that we, as researchers or people, directors of the museums, are really getting in touch directly with the descendants. No mm -hmm. lawyers, no nobody in between. So it's just us and them. Um, and, and, you know, the more valuable it gets and the more complicated it gets, of course. Uh, yeah, that's different, I guess. Can yeah. I ask, what, what makes it so powerful to have that kind of person-to-person -person contact is the first thing? Um, you mean why? Wait, so, so you were saying you try and get in touch with people without yes. with anything, people to people, um, and be the one to contact somebody about the objects that belong to their family. I was just wondering how, what makes that so powerful, do you think? Well, because it's usually this is something that that the, the, the descendants are not, you know, that they're not prepared. They they they, they don't expect this. I mean, mm -hmm. because it's usually like I'm, I'm, you know, I'm always talking about what I do. My colleagues who who deal with other kinds of objects that they have different stories to tell. But people like like me who who work with these objects that are not too valuable usually. Um, you know, we we reach out to family, and they they have never, you know, they 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 have no idea why why would they? I mean, how why should they know that their great grandfather once um, um, had to sell a book or an autograph to to an auction house because he needed money to finance his emigration? How how would they know that? It's it's mm. just and and so I'm I'm actually writing to people. Usually, I, it's an email I, I write, and I I just. Uh, very um slowly i i try to explain what this is all about and then i always say you know let's let's talk about it if you you know if you're interested we can always uh, talk on the phone and that's usually what we do um because you know you cannot explain everything in a letter you just can explain sort of the basics um and then it's usually really moving and and very special the the first contact i mean becky and christina who are here now we who were my first the worst ever i i got to know it was that was it's a very special situation i think for both sides and for us of course it's always like what are they going to say and sometimes um people react understandably a little sort of what's this you know mm -hmm. it's sure. and some kind of weird uh, internet scam you know people who are trying to, to sell us something or whatever so so it it, it takes time to build up trust and to uh to make um everybody realize that we really you know we found it and we really want to return it and then and now we want to talk about it and the washington principles always uh, say a just and fair solution is what we're and what we're looking for so it doesn't have to be restitution it can be any kind of solution yeah. but it's it's so important to make sure that that you know um we can only make an offer we i am always saying we let's it's like we extend our hand and then we just hope that 
somebody is taking it and um yeah it's, it's a man is is willing to to talk to us and wow and together yeah yeah no it sounds like it sounds i can see how that would be um uh a combination of exciting and also a little bit um uh maybe at the very beginning a little bit um intimidating until yeah. you're able to really make those connections yes um l- let me just ask i want to ask one more question and then i want to let other people ask questions because i'm okay. sure i've seen a bunch of them fly by and i bet they're a bunch of them okay. um so uh just here's a question looking forward uh, so I understand some parts of Providence are feel are changing as more institutions look into objects uh, that were related to not just the Nazi past, but general, Germany's colonial period, the communist era, and so on. Can you talk a little bit about how the field is changing? Yeah, it's. Um, I think it's a it's a very um, positive um, um, thing to happen um, um, development that um, that, that uh, because. People have started to do the research into Nazi looted art so many years ago. Um, there has been a growing awareness of this this idea that that uh, it's it's interesting, it's worthwhile, and it's necessary to look into the history of objects and to follow any kind of lead, any kind of suspicion that that there might be other contexts where uh, things were taken away uh, illegally, unlawfully. So, as part of um, wars or crimes or um genocides or you know different colonial um oppression and also um in germany especially of course the the gdr and also the the period just after the war the soviet zone of occupation so i think that's um it's it's very important i mean of course people knew that before and the research was also there before but i think because of this whole um process of um also getting more attention for what what we're doing um oh. it, it started to grow on people that there are so many more fields which we should look into and not just um the nazi period um i just hope that there's going to be so much more research in, in all these fields um i sometimes i'm a little you know i i hope that uh in the end it won't be just colonial um period research but that there will still be uh uh, enough um, room and, and enough money also to to continue to do the research we're doing right. because uh, there's still a lot to do. It's it's not a kind of research where you say, oh, now we're it's done, you know, <laughs> now that will be finished. Uh, uh, but it's uh, there's so much more and and um, so many more archives are being opened and uh, there's a lot of um, also digital knowledge uh, which can be shared and. Um, something I haven't talked about at all is but how important it is for all of us provenance researchers is, is this network of researchers. Mm-hmm. You know, we have, we have different organizations and none of us could do the work that we do alone. We always need other people, other researchers um, who we who we're in touch with. And uh, because, you know, it's very often um, different institutions uh, have stuff in their collections that come sure. from one collector or one person, which is spread out all over Germany or even Europe. And so it's just too, very important to, to get together and um, to, to get make, to know each other. Makes sense. I, um, maybe let me just restate this once and then we'll go to other questions. Um, it sounds like any good detective needs to know some other detectives. Right. Okay. All right. That makes sense to me. Um, uh, thank you, Annika. Thank you for that window into your work. Um, you. Now I'd like to bring on, bring back Karen Franklin who I believe has been monitoring the chat for questions. And uh, so let's have some questions because I think there I, I think there are a bunch of them. Karen, you mm-hmm. wanna, um, hello, Karen, thank you yes. for coming back and let's, let's go with some questions. Thank you. And first I want to acknowledge, uh, Annika, your enthusiasm and your energy is so incredibly admirable. Um, thank you. And uh, second of all, I'm a detective. Could you please send me Leo Kamnitzer's uh, I will. Uh, birthday and I'll yeah. see what I can do for you. Yeah, okay. So it's always all, good to make that kind of connection live. Yes. <laughs> yeah. so I'll work on it while you're answering your questions. I'll come up with something at the end. Third of all, I absolutely hate when the person who's fielding the questions continues to ask questions so no one else gets a chance. But yeah, I, it's your dead <laughs> need, I guess, as they say. So I apologize to anyone here. I think we have uh, time for most of the questions that have come in. But I actually received some, uh, some uh, restituted book 
a book that had belonged to my sixth cousin, six times removed, because he had been born in the early 1800s. And the book had obviously changed hands numerous times prior to the Nazi period. Mm -hmm. So the question in part is, um, when you have a expensive painting, you can either give it to a museum or divide the millions that it's worth. But when you have many descendants and there's only one small object or book, how do you, in your experience, make the decision as to who to whom it might be restituted? Well, I don't make the decisions. Uh, it's the the heirs who make the decisions. So all we do is to offer restitution to all the heirs, you know, be it one heir or two or three or fifteen or, or sixty, whatever. And then they and that's. So they have to work, <laughs> they have to get together. Um, what we do is we try to find all everybody we can find and to um, to let everybody know about the others. So I, I'm just in the, in the middle of one of those, a kind of process where, you know, I I uh, give out everybody's email address to, to, to all the group and then they have to get together and decide what they want to do. Um, and there's always the, the solution to say, it's, you know, like it's it's a very old book, um, we are very many people. Um, what are we going to do? And so there's always uh, one one idea is to to um, to accept the restitution, but then to loan it or to um, donate it to the institution, which is what the Heinemanns did in Lüneburg, which is also what many families do uh, with libraries. Um, so that's one solution. The other would be to um, to also accept the restitutions and then give it to some other institutions. I'm sure the Leo Beck Institute probably also received uh, some, yeah, some donations. So, so that's always a good thing. And I mean, like if when as ask me, of course, I always uh, try to uh, show the different options they might have. Um, and you can also some people give it to institutions which have already parts of the family documentation. So you know there might be some. It might be a, a family that's from another place and in, in that place there's already a museum or some kind of archive where they have other family heirlooms and so they might uh, also take it back and then give it to this other place um so there are many uh, many ways of, of doing this um, i want to interrupt with one quick just to, to say for um for museums who always you know there's always this thing of uh, institutions saying oh no 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 we don't want to want to, to start this research because then we have to to uh, to give back everything you know you have to return everything then we're going to be empty and that's just not true at all um because many many institutions as actually have this kind of um um yeah um solution with the families or well, that's not uh, a restitution as such you know uh, Annika I just want to jump in with one quick question Leo Kamnitzer was he born on the 1st of July in 1886 or is that a different Kamnitzer you know I I'm really sorry I, I I've got all the stuff at my office ah I'm, that, okay that's I'm, fine I'm, we have, we have somebody day. online who literally I, uh, I, I should have checked out. I'm sorry I didn't do it with you know there was Easter we had family here so yeah. I didn't I didn't get around to really no prepare. problem no problem this I, is not a I, quiz I, I, the, I, I have done the rest. <laughs> I, d I have got everything. I think yeah. I even found the names of descendants. So okay. I, I know more than I can tell you. No, I'm sorry. I don't I don't have the. Uh, no worries. The, no worries. The, uh, but you've probably found the right one. I'm uh, um, yeah. Well, I see my, my friend Gabrielle Hanna was writing about it. So I OK, I, I will. I will get back to everybody as soon as I can. But not right now. I, I'm focusing on talking now. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't have that. his descendants I now. So yeah, that's the Leo. I have his descendants. Oh, Gabby, you think you found the descendants? Yeah. Nice. If, if that's him. Okay. Yeah, great. Let's okay. just, you know, we can uh, always sorry, get, sorry. Get, get together. Right. We'll, sorry, we'll make not... sure everyone's connected, that's for sure. That's really embarrassing. <laughs> and and Gabrielle, have I got a job for you? So we'll talk later, okay? All right, good, good. <laughs> Annika, it is not a problem at all. We're not trying to spring <laughs> anything on you. It is, it's a great story. Everybody's excited because it's a good story. Uh, Karen, why don't you come with the next question? Because we have lots of yeah. good ones out there. So um, Roxana Dunn asked if you work only in the specific town in Lüneburg or if you uh, are willing to look in other locations and what part of Germany is uh, Lüneburg in? Okay. Uh, I used to work in Lüneburg. Now I'm working in Hamburg and that's both in Northern Germany 
uh, Hamburg is on the river Elbe, pretty much up in the north of Germany, and Hamburg, uh, Lüneburg is very close. It's uh, 60 kilometers. Um, and um, uh, well, if if I find a job somewhere else, I might <laughs> do that as well. But uh, it's it's of course always good to be in a place where it's which is not too far away from where you live. So it's uh, it's usually sort of around northern Germany that that I would be working. And I hope that I can continue to work in Hamburg, but you never know. Yeah, it's difficult. Right. And and I'm just curious, Joel, do we know if other uh, awardees also do work in restitution or have come to do work in restitution? So now you'll get me to say kind of what Annika just said, maybe, but I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> Same. Yeah. Um, and uh, a question from Natty Hoffman is, do you uh, talk about your work in institutions within Germany or outside of Germany that are considering doing this kind of restitution work? Yes, yes, I do. Um, on different levels, um, well, uh, there, I, I was talking about these networks. So the, the networks of prominence researchers um, um, very often organize uh, conferences or um, also educational, um, have educational efforts. So we, we try and get, uh, to get together people who uh, are thinking about doing this kind of work and um, um, to, well to, to to help them a little bit if like if you're working in an institution and you found something and you have the feeling that you know there's something not quite clean about uh, the provenance and then what do you do so it's always good if you know who to turn to and uh, if you know what you could do what kind of research you could start um, uh, and Mr. Hartman can tell you more about this, but there's this thing of uh, if you want to start research, you can do this uh, uh, first check, like a um, you know just just checking if if it would be worth to do more research. So so we have uh, different ways of of um, raising awareness and of telling telling people how they would start. What I also do, I really. Um, I'm always happy to to give talks about just like, like the general public about the subject because I think it's it's a subject that um, should should be known more should be you know there should be more awareness for this and um, and so I always um, like to talk about it and I um, the last two years uh, people have asked me for the for Holocaust Remembrance Day to, to to give a talk on on my work and the Holocaust and that's for me is a very important topic because I mean you know many provenance researchers are uh, art historians and they focus more on the objects and on the art and I mean of course they know a lot about uh, the background but I'm an historian so for me uh, the history itself and the history of the Holocaust and how um, the, the the theft and the loot uh, go, goes together with the Holocaust that's always been a, a very important topic so I always try to tell people about it and see see how the connection is. Thank you. Uh, a question from Margaret, I guess it's McKillen. She wants, uh, she has asked if you would speak about the history workshop and Hans Jürgen's insistence that the museums add illegal acquisitions that helped you come to work on this. I'm not quite sure what that means on this. Okay, history. so Margaret, yeah, Margaret is also a descendant from a Lüneburg family. Hi, Margaret, so thank you for asking. Um, and she's also come to Lüneburg and she donated objects to the museum herself, which we were very grateful to. And she's actually referring to the fact that the Lüneburg research wouldn't have started, I wouldn't have started if there hadn't been a person from the history workshop, which is, uh, it's just uh, volunteers in, in this small town of Lüneburg uh, looking into Nazi history, like, you know, all the Obermeier awardees <laughs> or many of them. Um, and they, one of them um, was the first to find out about these objects that the museum had acquired in 1940 from the family of Marcus Heinemann illegally. And he um, wrote to the museum and he also went to the press and he said, you know, the museum has to do something about it. They have to do, they have to, to do the right research and they have to find out what this was all about. And he was very insistent and that was very good because otherwise maybe it wouldn't have come about. Um, and so with the help of uh, financing, uh, <laughs> The the um it it it, uh, it finally um, the the research started uh, and Hans Jürgen and also maybe Margaret uh, very um, understandably um, often thought that it, it takes so, too long you know why why does it take so long and why why did it take so long to finally uh, live up to the the, um, the responsibility um, and 
I, I think they're right. And I, I think that's one of the problems we are having very often. I mean, you know, you, you reach out to S and they write to you, I wish you could have written half a year earlier because my grandfather or my mother or my aunt just died, uh, you know, and I'm sure it would have meant so much to them. And of course, it still means a lot to the next generations, but it's, it's, um, yeah, it's, it's something we have to, to face that it's too late in, in many ways, it's too late. It's not like too, too late forever, uh, but, but, you know, we, we have to, um, I think, so the, I always start by saying, I am sorry that it took so long and I wish we could have done this earlier, but yeah, uh, we're doing it now. So um, Karen, I want to interrupt for a second very quickly. So I see we're at the bottom of the hour. And um, I just want to double check with Karen and Annika. Can you stay on for a few more minutes for just feel some of these other questions? Uh, great. So what I want to just say briefly is to anybody who needs to leave, which there might be somebody who leaves because it was meant to be an hour long. I just want to say thank you for uh, participating in this event with us. Thank you for seeing a window into Annika's work. Um, I want to encourage, encourage people who are curious because uh, I'm going to put my exec uh, executive director hat on here. Uh, if you're curious about Widen the Circle, come to our website and come check us out. Uh, Widen the Circle ra raises money to support this important work. Um, and I would be so grateful if you would consider investing in it. Uh, you can do so by coming to our website, which is widenthecircle.org, widenthecircle.org. Uh, you can also, um, well, actually, you can come to our website. That's the main way. And um, there's a donate button there. Um, and you can also encourage people who are curious about what we're up to just to come check us out and maybe to join our email list. So let me, let me leave it at that. And then I would just a quick reminder, which is that on April 18th, we will have another event, this time with Christoph Mani, who Annika knows well, I think, an award winner who works in an area of Germany where the power of the far right and neo-Nazis is growing. His modern and creative approach to remembrance in Jewish history has energized young people and adults alike. At the same time, he's come up against really serious resistance to the idea of remembering it all. Um, and we should have a link to register for that and chat. And with that, I would just say thanks everyone who's given these, these thoughtful questions. If you need to go, feel free to go. But if you want to stick around and ask some more questions, I can see a few here. We'd love to, we'd love to get through them all if we can. So thank you. All right. That was, that was my, that was my pause. Let us continue. Karen. Well, and I like the story. I, I like the question. Uh, again, another one by Natty Hoffman. Uh, it's a general question, how do descendants respond? But I wonder if you might tell us a specific story or two in that regard about something special or, or significant that occurred with a restitution. Um, um, about how, how, the, how the descendants responded or, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, you've seen the, the Heinemann story you've seen, probably, you've seen in the film, so I don't need to talk about it. That, that's been a very, a uh, very special story that was actually the first restitution that I did um, in Hamburg. Um, and we had found books by Hans Sternheim, who was a, um, he owned a book printing enterprise and he was a collector of books, a book lover. And he, um, he was forced to sell many of his books uh, because he was persecuted as a Jew and, and he had to move from apartment to apartment. And eventually he was, he was killed in the Holocaust. And, um uh he had a daughter who survived and she also had a daughter and i i found her through many <laughs> uh, yeah a lot of corners and finally i i found her and i um i saw that she was uh she, if she was still alive she she would have been uh, almost 90 year old so i thought maybe she was you know longer alive but then i got the information that she still lived under the address which uh, was already her her mother's address in the in the 50s and 60s in berlin and so i wrote to her i wrote and i i had only a, a postal address i didn't find any email addresses or whatever and i thought well she's almost 90 years old so i'll just write an old-fashioned letter and um uh, then she <laughs> she emailed back like the next day and she, uh, she's, uh, she. It was pretty short, and it was. It said, uh, "Sent from my iPhone." <laughs> so you know, she, she, she wrote back an email uh, with her, with her mobile, and uh, and she was uh, completely up to date with all the technical um, um, appliances, and she, she was uh, very, uh, very open, and she was, um, she couldn't believe it because this was actually a person who still had known, she had known her grandfather. She had actually lived with them. And she told me 
that they lived together, her mother who had been um, divorced from her non-Jewish husband and her grandparents and her as a child. And she said, they never told me anything. You know, I always had to leave the room when it was like a difficult topic coming up. And um, and so she had no idea what was going on. She just realized that it was lots of pressure and lots of difficult things. And she said that one day she returned from, from school and her grandparents were gone. You know, they had been deported and that was it. And nobody explained anything really. And she didn't know that much about them. And so that was very, very moving to to be on the phone to to this wonderful, wonderful lady um, who really remembered her grandfather and who could tell me stories about him, but she had no idea what where his books had gone or what had happened to many of his belongings. Um, and so we got to know each other. I traveled to Berlin. I, I took the books with me and I I actually said, you know, more or less, we can I can already leave them with you. And she said, I oh, know, you know. I don't want to have them. Um, and they've been at your library for so long. You, you know, let's just leave them there. And she said, I don't have any kids, you know, so who's nobody would want that. And it's all going to be thrown into the, <laughs> into the trash. She actually said that. Um, so I'd much rather that you keep it at the library. And I, you know, I asked a couple of times, I, I said, are you really sure, you know, after a couple of weeks and months and so no, no, but she said, no, no, we're going to do that. And then we actually managed to, to have a restitution with her in, in 2019. Um, and she came to Hamburg and it was a absolutely wonderful experience. Um, and then before she came, I said, okay, I'm going to talk a lot, a little bit about the case. And then the director is going to talk about the library and you will, you know, there will be this kind of not really restitution, but we will hand over the books and you will. And then I said, would you like to say something as well? And she said, I'm not sure. Hmm, maybe, I don't know. And then she called me and she said, yeah, I, I'm going to do it, you know. Uh, and then she came and she gave this wonderful talk. And she started out by saying, I'm almost 90 years old and, old, and this is the first time that I actually give a public speech in my whole life. <laughs> um, and it was uh, absolutely amazing. And then she um, I always wanted her to come back to Hamburg because I had found out something about the Hamburg part of her family and I wanted to take her there and so on. And, and she said, yeah, yeah, I'm coming. And then we had uh, the pandemic uh, and then she died last year. Um, and we were in touch a couple of times, but, and I'm, uh, it was just a wonderful experience. And this was one of the few instances where I wasn't too late, you know, where I, it was just the right time. To, I mean, of course, it would have been even better if her mother had been still alive, but that's, um, but on, it was, it was very, very special. It's a Long beautiful. Story. I'm sorry, these stories are not, I cannot tell them really very, very quickly, but. No, it's a beautiful story. Uh, Joel, I'm not quite sure what this uh, is, um, with a little note here to call on Edgar Heinemann. Yeah, so Ed yeah, Edgar, Edgar has had his, he's had his hand up for a while. Yeah, Edgar, oh, okay, is. I'm sorry. I, no yeah. worries, no worries. Wait, wait, it's Thank you very all much. Good. Thank you very much. Annika, you look younger than nine years ago. That's for you. <laughs> same, same. Congratulations. <laughs> Congratulations. The Heinemann Guatemalan descendants will always be thankful to you having lived Lüneburg and all the family we have worldwide. Thank you. Vielen Dank. Muchas gracias. Oh, Abrazos. Thank you. thank you, Edgar. Thank you so much. <laughs> beautiful. Lovely. That's quite beautiful. Uh, one, one more question from Angelica Rieber. Uh, that we are often, and I hope I say this approximately correctly, we are confronted by um, um, uh, which was confiscated. It would be interesting to find out where uh, this ended. We find the lists in archives. Um, would you like to comment on that? I have no idea yeah. what it means. Yeah. So, so... May I add uh, something to the question? <laughs> um, so we find these lists of removal um, goods in, in the archives and often there is the information that they never got it and I often look through the lists and see really art uh, and books as well um, worthy he thinks so we didn't have the time to look at it but this would be a very interesting question to find out especially art is easier <laughs> to find out what happened to it? Where did it yes. end? Yes. Yeah. 
there is actually a very interesting project about that. Uh, it's called uh, Lost Lift, I think. Herr Hartmann, yeah. Yes. Lost Lift, I think it's called. And it's uh, it's also uh, <laughs> due to the generous financing of the German federal and um, uh, state and, and also the, uh, yeah. Uh, so the Federal Republic. And it's, uh, it's a website. You can actually go there and have a look. Um, and it, the lifts are these these containers which contain the so-called Umzugsgut. So these were the things, the people who had to emigrate um, before the war uh, and who still got out, um, most of them to the States, but also to other places. And um, they were even able to take some of their household goods with them. So, you know, a little bit of furniture, maybe smaller things, books, art, uh, things that were valuable to them, but they couldn't take it with them like in their in their suitcase. So they needed to get a container and to to find um and to do in a um yeah somebody to to take it over to 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 the other side of the world basically and so they put them into into these lifts into these boxes and they were sent to the next uh port uh to the next harbor and uh, in many cases this was hamburg or bremerhaven in germany the two major ports and from there they would uh, go to either to england or to to, to holland Oh yeah, Definitely. yeah, and also so there's different places, right? The lost lift is mainly about the places in Germany, but I know there's a whole network of uh, people uh, trying to get together with different ports in Holland, in Italy, and Germany, and so so on. So what happened is when war break out broke out, these containers could not be taken to to America any longer. So they would sit in these in these parts in you know some kind of uh, container halls, and they would sit there for some time. And uh, in in Germany in forty one, um, it was decided that uh, that they were all confiscated by the government, and they were um, they were actually uh, broken. You know they were opened forcefully, and everything that was in there was auctioned off or given to different institutions. Um, and there's a lot of research on that. And uh, in Hamburg, the library, many, many of our books that we got from the Gestapo were actually taken from these lifts, from these containers in, in the port of Hamburg. Uh, and so that's completely illegal and that's definitely Nazi, um, Nazi looted um, objects. Um, so there's there's been a lot of research. You could you can uh, get and you know can write to me directly and i can maybe uh, also put you in touch with people who do this research in holland i once went to a conference where all these people got together which was really interesting so it's a it's a big field and the research has started a couple of years ago and people are really getting um, to know more and more about it and also i saw i just saw in the chat there's a question if uh, you can uh, talk to me directly or write to me yes of course joel you know um, you can give my email address to everybody i will put it in the chat now then thank yeah, you i'm very very happy to answer all your questions and you know to th there's so much more I, I would like to talk about i have a feeling i i missed so much but um you, just write to me and i'll get back Annika, it's quite amazing that so many people who began this conversation with you a bit of time ago are still on the call. It's a tribute to the interest <laughs> that we all have in the work that you do and how well you articulate you. what you do. So mm -hmm. I asked the final question, which was, I think, the first question that came in from Jill Strauss. And again, I think this is a, a, a person, very personal question about what it means to you, for you, to play this role. Uh, uh, in the in looted art and restitution and return. What it means to me? Well, I don't know. <laughs> um, well, it's 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 very very important, and I I'm just very happy that I found this this kind of job, which is very close to my heart. And at the same time, it's a it's I'm glad I I can well I, I'm trying to do this as professionally as I can. And I'm sure there are people out there who better provenance research just than me. Um, but I I really like this. Um, I, I, I think I'm pretty good at the things I talked about. There might be more others that I'm, I'm not so good at. But uh, um, I I always feel that probably and the main thing for me is is really to to make sure that the descendants feel that we we finally did the right thing, you know, after so many, many years of doing the wrong thing and not doing the right thing. And so that's where I see my role, really. That's a beautiful statement and a wonderful 
ending or or link to turn it over to Joel. Uh, Thank uh, you. Thank you very much. And I all I can do is uh, add. First, thank you, Karen, for all those questions and for helping uh, on the Leo Beck side of things. And Annika, uh, that was amazing. Uh, thank you so much for that final summation, but also all of the other things you talked about. I think your passion, your experience, your uh, sense of un, um, uh, writing injustice um, is something that uh, I think all of us can take inspiration from. So uh, thank you. And thank you thank to everyone you. for joining Thanks us. Thanks, everybody. Very glad we're all there. Very good. And thank you, everyone.